Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The effects that the turbulent Chinese markets are having the world over is pause for rethinking China-U.S. relations and what can be done to stabilize the economy as well as the relations with China, particularly in light of the fact that the upcoming visit of the Chinese President Xi Jinping to Washington later this month. The visit to Washington is, of course, pegged to the annual address to the United Nations General Assembly in New York on September 28th. Here to discuss all of this today, we are joined by a very esteemed guest, Henry Rosemont. He's a distinguished research professor emeritus at St. Mary's College of Maryland and visiting scholar of religious studies at Brown University. His books include A Chinese Mirror, Moral Reflections on Political Economy, and his recently released book, Against Individualism, a Confucian Rethinking of the Foundation of Morality, Politics, Family, and Religion. Professor Rosemont, a pleasure to have you on The Real News Network. Happy to be here. So, Professor, in a recent article you penned, you had some advice for President Obama uh, in terms of uh, President of China's visit to Washington. Uh, take us through the steps, advice you have for him. Um, most importantly, are all the saber-rattling advice he's getting from the Republican candidates for president and for some members of the House and for most of the media, and try to negotiate some genuine negotiations for a nation and a world that is increasingly in trouble. I believe this is a historic opportunity to start changing the course of the decline of the global structure of the world, uh, the decline, continued decline of U.S.-China relations and the decline of the world's economy. All of those need to be reversed, and the best way to reduce them, in my view, is by China and U.S. working in cooperation, and I mean cooperation, close cooperation, no competition, and certainly no confrontation. Professor Rosemont, uh, you uh, advised in your few steps that you had outlined for President Obama that picking up on the uh, ground in relation to the environment and cutting CO2 levels um, and the agreement that the U.S. and China had come to during President Obama's last visit was a good takeoff point. Tell us more what you meant by that and what else you advise in terms of building trust and uh, and the negotiations you think should be taking place during his the, uh, the agreement with uh, Xi Jinping uh, and the president on the um, issue of climate change was a good one but it was only a beginning and for many people in the environmental movement disappointing uh, you, your, your group, them yourselves, had a very good program on that just a little while ago with a couple of speakers, one from IPS and a Chinese economist, uh, uh, pointing out just how little was really accomplished in terms of heading away from the disaster that we're heading toward. Now, but it was an accord. It was done in a friendly manner. Both sides clearly could see that they had something to gain. Neither side had to spend any time hectoring or lecturing each other. So that would be a good place to go. Rather than have Obama, for example, beat up once more the Chinese for a weaknesses in their democracy or not having one, or beat up on them for their individual human rights records, or have some Chinese somewhere beat up on us because of our attempts at hegemony and being the master imperialist. Those things don't go very far. We are not going to change the Chinese on democracy, it seems. We're not going to change them, at least in the short run, on issues of human rights any more than the Chinese are going to get us to stop trying to be number one. So I don't think we should even try those things we shouldn't do with them. We should go back and try to greatly strengthen the climate change agreement. And then we should talk about a host of other things that is in the best interests 
of both countries that both have to surrender something, but not much in terms of gaining the trust of the other and to the long-term benefit of both. I'll give you some examples if you like, but a lot of them are simple. They don't threaten security. They're not a risk to the economy. They could be done if people would do the negotiations much more on the basis of trust than competition or confrontation. Okay, give me some of those specific examples that you think would uh, uh, really help take it to the next level. Negotiations with the Chinese are usually very nuanced, very politically vague, but I think this uh, one that you address in terms of the climate change is a very strong and tangible thing. But what else like that uh, could you point to that you think would be uh, the, US can the U.S. can offer to stabilize the Chinese stock market which, of course, would contribute to the stabilization of our own. And they can offer, and that is to the great advantage of the Chinese, not just to have their stock market stabilized, but to begin to allow people more to move from an investment export economy to a domestic demand economy. When people feel their money is safe in the stock market, they'll buy goodies. If they don't, they won't. Professor Rosemont, how can uh, the U.S. specifically uh, reinforce the Chinese economy? Here you re made reference to uh, the use of the U.N., for example, and, and their participation in the IMF as a potential stabilizing factor. What did you mean by that? It means, well, and here's the way, the biggest way the United States can help the Chinese economy through the stock market stabilization and more is simply to tell the Chinese we promise not to interfere with the run being be becoming a currency on which all countries can have drawing rights. We've always stopped that in the past, but it makes a huge difference in get drawing investment from overseas in China. It helps Chinese investors invest abroad without feeling they have to put everything in their own country. It produces its own finance market, if you will, and it would help the stock market. At the same time we did that, we could suggest that the Chinese take a much more active role in the IMF and coordinate it more with this developing Asian bank. The, something else I've been suggesting is that none of the institutions that are global in scope seem to be capable of doing their job anymore as the global economy conflicts, everything continue to go forward. And why would the U.S. want to do that? I mean, at the moment, they can flex their muscles at the IMF, and uh, they have control of that. But supporting the Asian Development Bank might be in competition with the IMF. Yes. The, the, the world is growing too small to engage too much longer in too much competition, in my uh, estimation. The problems of the world are not going to go away by competition, because in competition, by definition, in addition to winners, you must have losers. Losers don't like being lost. So what we have to try to do is build up a system in which everybody gives up a little something so that everybody gets a fair amount. Now, the inst it requires institutions to kind of bring an order to doing that. Our financial markets cannot go unregulated globally. We need a strong IMF, World Bank, Asian Bank, and they should work in a coordinated way. We need to do things to hold the EU together and perhaps the euro. That's falling apart as Germany is a creditor, Greece is a credit and you're finding more and more more and more disruption, dislocation, and dislike in Europe. And if Europe falls apart, the whole globe suffers a great deal. But right now Europe is just torn between creditors 
and debtors. And that situation is only going to get worse unless there are some international organizations that can help bring some order out of that chaos, it seems to me. Uh, Professor Rosemont, uh, uh, Susan Rice, uh, in preparing for the visit of the president, the Chinese president, Xi Jinping, expressed his hope for a sustainable and steady growth as far as relations with the U.S. is concerned. It seems to me that there is very little emphasis on sort of long-term planning in terms of collaboration and cooperation with the Chinese. Why is this so endemic in, in terms of U.S. foreign policy? America is a capitalist nation, and it insists on as much of a laissez-faire capitalism as it's possible to get for one reason. It knows it will win almost all the competitions. That's why it pushes free trade so much. I can document that for anyone who's interested. You can give them my, um, my email address. But we want free, open everything, because when free, open everything is the United States tends to win. It's only when other countries protect some of their products that they can sell them because we can undersell them, or at least most of the time. But now it is possible, the more that China, for example, continues its military buildup, the harder it is for it to sustain economic growth. We talk about China as an aggressive threat to us. It's not an aggressive threat. There are 21 battle uh, aircraft carriers in the world. The United States owns 12 of them. The United, China has one that's retrofitted from an old beat-up Russian one. For the Chinese to build 11 more aircraft carriers to catch up with us is going to cost an awful lot of money. China cannot afford a blue ocean navy. But yet, if we keep up the build-up, if we keep up the pressure, they're going to have to build one. But there is an option. And oddly enough, it was suggested by the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Michael Mullen. He says, what the world needs is what he calls a thousand-ship navy. As many countries as wish to can participate with as many ships as they like under the general but not sole leadership of the U.S., and they will patrol the world seas. They'll receive training on how to fight piracy, fight training on how to handle refugees in the open water, receive training on how to work against terrorism, and they'll all be trained to provide humanitarian work in areas that experience an earthquake, a tsunami, or things like that. That would allow all navies to reduce their expenditures and draw a considerable amount of security around the world. That's a little thing. We could say we could do it. Let me keep going a little farther so you can get the hang of which way I'm going. We pushed the Chinese to get much tougher on North Korea, be tougher on the refugee, don't give them so much, add sanctions like we want to sanction them, and the Chinese are reluctant to do that. Do we offer the Chinese anything in return? No, we just tell them to do that. We like to order them around. We don't like to negotiate. The Chinese don't want to rein in or do sanctions too much. One, because they've been a good big brother to North Korea for a long time, and you don't like to abandon friends of long standing. But China might do it, and here's their real fear, if the United States says, you join us in applying the sanctions and making them tough. And then when the North and the South reunify, we promise we won't send any troops to the North or put nuclear weapons there either, because we know that would be right on your border. And the Chinese know that too, very well. That's something we could do. We could give things. We could recognize easily the Chinese claims to security concerns in the South China Sea by saying we recognize, want to be recognized for the same claims in the Caribbean. 
Now let's both of us take our claims and our interests to the international maritime groups and try to settle them that way. Not just tell the Chinese what they should be doing, why we do nothing, or do the opposite of what we tell them. This is why we can't, this is what negotiations would be about, but they can only be built on a basis of trust, not competition or confrontation. Professor Henry Rosemont, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, yes, I've only begun. <laughs> and thank you for joining us on The Real News Network.